Switch on today's news talk radio. Very entertaining. Yeah. TNT. On June 3rd, Gary Connolly was sworn in as Haiti's new prime minister. This appointment comes at a critical juncture and represents a hopeful step towards stabilization. Our next guest and his family lived in Haiti for many years, and he's the chief operating officer at Mission of Hope. Uh, Mission of Hope, of course, we've talked about on the show uh, and has been uh, seen as a gold standard organization providing aid to the most vulnerable people of Haiti uh, by global governments, NGOs, and local leaders over the last 25 years. His name is Drew Garrison. Drew, welcome to State of the Nation. Thanks for having me. Well, we're really pleased you're able to join us. We've spoken with Brad Johnson a couple of times while doing our best to keep up with the situation in Haiti. It's a really harrowing set of circumstances for the citizens of Haiti, but there's a new PM in the country now. Give us your thoughts on his election and how it may mark a turning point for the better for Haiti. For us, we're excited with with anything that makes it seem like Haiti's moving forward. Uh, at the end of the day, we're we're thinking about the the hundreds of thousands of people that are impacted, people that aren't able to go to school, they're not able to work, they're not able to eat. Um, so although we're not necessarily in the middle of, uh, of all of those decisions, when we see forward momentum, it gives us hope and we're, we're excited about where this is going. Uh, we believe it to be a step forward. Um, that doesn't mean we're, we're through everything and there's a lot that still has to be done, uh, but we're excited about it as an organization. We're excited for the people of Haiti. One of the most dangerous Western conceits is that civilization, ordered society, well-ordered society, is the default setting for humanity. Nothing could be further from the truth. And Haiti is a case study in just how quickly a country can go off the rails and have absolutely uh, not a functioning government. What are the roadblocks? What are the, what are the initial challenges for the new prime minister to reestablishing government control of that country? Well, I think over the years, um, you know, to look back and, and say, hey, we, we want to see Haiti how it was before isn't necessarily the ultimate goal. Uh, I wouldn't say that it was the in the healthiest places. It's had it's had seasons. Uh, it's had seasons of great success. And then we've obviously had disasters and hurricanes and earthquakes. But government in a place like Haiti often, in, in, like many other places, is a strive for power. And so I think our biggest roadblock that, that we see is just the fight, whether it's amongst you know, we're hopeful the president council can work together with the new prime minister, along with all the INGOs uh, that are a part of it. There's just so many voices and so many hands in the middle of it. Often the people of Haiti and often those that it impacts the most aren't the ones that are being thought of. So if I think about a roadblock, it's it's how much involvement is the right amount and how much do we let the people of Haiti decide what's best for their future? Right. I imagine that uh, that representation uh, is something that the people really want there, uh, especially in the in the wake of, you know, all the, the violence that we've seen um, over the last few months. I mean, how how does this change uh, immediately change or does it um, affect the you know, because there seem to be a lot of gang violence. Uh, we, we saw stories about, you know, uh, prisoners being let out um, in large masses and a lot of difficulty getting food and basic services too because people are afraid you know to get wrapped up in or collateral collateral damage you know killed in in some sort of violence scenario so has that it, it is that calming down or do you expect it too soon i i think there's still a chance that there's a there's a match that gets lit and when it comes to the violence and it comes to the gangs i don't expect them to just back down um, I expect that it potentially gets worse before it gets better, but I think we might be on that process. I spoke with a couple people on the ground, um, locals on the ground in Port-au-Prince, and they're no less fearful of going to the bank or going to the grocery store than they were weeks ago. Uh, but we do see some positive signs. The port in Port-au-Prince, which had been closed since March, was opened about two weeks ago. And we as an organization were able to get over three million meals um, distributed uh, which is a positive. Um, it's just a drop in the bucket when we look at the big picture, um, but we're ready and prepared to step into some of those spaces. But I don't think we're out of the out of the clear. I don't think we're in the clear yet at this point. Yeah. And, and how important were those meals? Because, you know, when Brad was here, it was like, 
you know, we, we were hearing about, you know, how difficult it was for you guys to get, just get those things to people. The port being back open, that must really alleviate some of that. You're able to get a much higher volume out now, I imagine. Certainly. Yeah, we had several, several containers of food that we were able to distribute and even getting to see some of the pictures and the faces of, of whether it's orphanage directors or schools or other partner organizations that we work with in the country as they literally risk their lives um, to, to come into Port-au-Prince, to come into these locations and pick up these food. Um, our employees, not just our leadership that has been unbelievably brave and, and I could not be more proud of them, but it goes to the forklift drivers, the security guards, uh, those that are renting local public transportation to come and pick up boxes of food because the, the orphanage that they run in the country hasn't had food in two or three months or maybe even longer. And the only way for them to get that is to drive through multiple gang infested areas to come and get it. But the fact that we were able to even to get it in and begin to distribute, distribute it, uh, we're very thankful for that opportunity. Yeah, and we're very glad to hear that. That was one of the biggest things that we were worried about last time we talked to Brad, you know, just, just hearing how difficult it was getting food to certain places in the country. So this is good news. This is more good news. We've had a number of good news stories today, which are uh, sort of rare to find. So we really want to thank you for joining us. We're going to pick it up right here. we got a few more questions. We want to talk a little bit about Mission of Hope, maybe, for anyone who's just, just you know, me, we have a lot of new listeners and viewers coming in every day, so uh, we want to make sure that you know how to find Drew and Brad and the wonderful crew over there at missionofhope.com. Uh, hold the line. We'll be right back with more State of the Nation after this headline from today's News Talk, TNT. Turn on the news! I have a little news flash. TNT Radio News. For TNT, this is James O'Neill. The United Nations Security Council voted in favor of a U.S.-led resolution for a Gaza ceasefire, President Joe Biden announced on May 31st. Thirteen of the 15 members, except Russia, supported the deal. Nigel Farage, leader of the Reform UK Party, predicts the governing Conservative Party in the UK is on the verge of collapse. French President Emmanuel Macron has dissolved the National Assembly and called a snap general election after exit polls predicted a poor performance by his Renaissance Party in the EU Parliament election. Why not give TNT Radio a follow? We're on all major social platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Gab, and Getter. Help us get the word out as we cover the biggest topics of our time right here on today's News Talk. TNT Radio. TNT Radio. So, Drew, I'm, I'm interested. Tell us a little bit more about the new prime minister, Gary Connolly. Uh, what, what kind of campaign did he run? How did that work out? Was that dangerous? And, and what, is he, what, what are sort of his directions uh, that everybody's hoping for for the country? Right. I, I do think that anytime you're in a position of power um, in a country like Haiti, in a state that it's in, that there's, there's some obvious innate danger in that. I think it, it's brave for him to step into that position. He's got some experience um, of being in that position before in a transitional uh, opportunity in the past. Um, I do know that he's worked well uh, with international actors, whether that's the US government, uh, whether that's the UN. So he's got some experience doing that. And so I think during this season and this transition, uh, to at some point, hopefully like a duly elected government that we've been looking for in Haiti for almost half a decade at this point, um, that he understands his role is not to step in and seize that power long term, but to help transition it. I think we've got hope. We've got hope for that to happen. My big concern is that in a nation that's basically been run by drug lords for, as you said, almost half a decade, they're not going to willingly give up power over their territory. Does the new prime minister have enough people willing to step into important roles in the government? Uh, the various ministries that need to be run to be able to, for example, just provide basic services to people. You know, I think it's bigger than that. I think the brain drain that we've seen happen with immigration policy in the U.S. and the visas that have been extended, um, there is going to be a lack, especially of the younger generation. Uh, so many of them, if they were able to leave and go to the U.S., and I can't, I can't fault them for that. I live in the U.S. Oh. I, I love my life here. So we've seen doctors, we've seen teachers. When I think about, you know, an education system where you've got four years where basically kids have, have not been able to get an education. And so for them to come back to school, where are the teachers? Because if they were educated and they had an opportunity to go to the U.S., they're gone. And they're, they're somewhere here in the States working and making a life for themselves. And so I think that extends all the way up to people in ministry, uh, in the ministries and the government offices, um, being able to 
to create a functional system that was that was rocky to begin with is going to be quite the challenge. So he's got a lot. He's got a lot in front of him. He better have the right people with him. Um, and there's a there's a lot of people that want to see him succeed, uh, that want to see the presidential council succeed. But there's still a lot of rebuilding that must be done. Yeah, it sounds like a, a rough road ahead. But the, as you pointed out, you know, this is really good progress that we're at this point now. The port is back open, able to get more food in there. Uh, you can follow Mission of Hope on x.com at M-O-H Caribbean. Uh, that's the, the X handle, Twitter handle. And missionofhope.com is the website. And you guys have such an amazing track record and history. Mission of Hope, they've been stationed in Haiti since 1998, aiding humanitarian crises through natural disasters, political upheaval, of course, the weird events of 2020 and uh, onward. So um, tell us a little bit about, you know, the importance of Mission of Hope as it pertains to, to Haiti, because, you know, you guys do a lot of work there. Well, we're, we're excited and hopeful to get back to doing what we feel like God's called us to do. Um, and that's that's help hurting people in a, in a country that needs it. But we've We've been able to see almost 130,000 students every day that are a part of our food security and nutrition program. Uh, that's done through local schools. That's done by by local organizations, churches, um, Haitian schools, Haitian orphanages. We've also uh, been very involved in medical care, um, orphan care. Uh, all of those things are going to need to be picked back up. All, all of those pieces are going to need to be put back together. Um, we're we're thinking about a functional government. Um, but some of those basic needs that we hope to be able to provide, uh, we hope to see our team be able to uh, get back to doing um, what they feel like God's called them to do. But we're also more than willing to step into this season and we're ready. And we we go to bed every night thinking about kids living in IDP camps or living in communities where food isn't available. Um, and we just hope and pray that that we know God's got a plan for them. And we're hopeful that that day is going to come very soon. Absolutely. Absolutely, Drew. And, and you know, Mission of Hope is um, one of the things that Timothy and I appreciate, appreciate about Mission of Hope is that uh, the whole time that it's been around, it's, it's acted free of political motivation whatsoever and is, you know, as you just said, it's a faith-based organization, a humanitarian organization. Um, and, you know, <laughs> just to just to underline what you're saying about it, you guys have provided more than 400 million meals since 1998. I mean, imagine that. Educated over 163,000 students. I mean, I could go on. Your accomplishments as an organization are um, staggering. You know, I see a lot of NGOs out there, and they put, you know, 78% of their income into overhead and staff and advertising and and all these things but um when when someone donates to mission of hope uh it you know the the track record speaks for itself yeah and unlike well, unicef and clinton global initiative and other ngos i think it's fairly i'm on fairly safe ground is to say you've trafficked precisely zero children allegedly in their case right we we have I can confidently say that uh, we we have not and just got word from our team just earlier this afternoon we've we've reached over 13 million meals this year uh, in a year that's been very very difficult to do that and so proud of our team um, and believe that because we've we've really invested in in local leadership and local uh, organizations and it's not been about us so even when we pulled out after the pandemic. Uh, when things were unsafe, that there were no Americans involved on the ground, that our team was actually able to accelerate and do more. And I think that's why we've been able to be successful. We obviously all have political opinions. We have opinions uh, in Haiti. But at the end of the day, our our main focus is the people. And we believe they've got a right, that they've got rights, and, and we want to come alongside them and support them. We want to invest in the next generation so that we don't have this repeat in 15 or 20 years. Jude, just logistically, how do you get 13 meals into a country when the port was closed? That that, that just blows my mind. We've been able to work through the, the port in Capetia, which is in the northern coast. It's the second largest city in Haiti. And so uh, we've had a distribution network. We've moved many of our leadership staff 
uh, and repositioned them. It's it's a safer environment for them logistically. Obviously, we've we've then got a truck uh, meals across the country where we can. There there is a bottleneck in Port-au-Prince, so anybody in the southern peninsula of Haiti, uh, which has some of the most rural and some of the the worst hit places, even looking back at the earthquake. Uh, of a couple of years ago in Hurricane Matthew of 2016 that are still recovering from that. So the Port-au-Prince port getting open has allowed us to, to hopefully begin to serve those in the South as well. Excellent. Well, that is amazing news. Uh, thank you again for bringing us good news and for everything that you and all your colleagues do over at Mission of Hope. Again, missionofhope.com is where you want to go. And at M-O-H Caribbean on Twitter uh, is where you want to go follow. Drew Garrison, it has been a really uplifting conversation. We know there's a lot more work to do, and the people of Haiti really need all the help uh, that can be given. And I'll echo what Timothy said there. Uh, this is the kind of organization you want to look for if if you're looking to make these kind of humanitarian donations uh, as opposed to you know UNICEF or your Clinton Foundations or anything like that. Uh, Drew, any final thoughts before we have to let you go? No, Timothy Brown, I appreciate it. Um, obviously, we're, we're honored. Um, we can't do it alone, and so there's going to need to be others. Uh, we need partners. We need people. We need other organizations to be ready to step up uh, and just excited to see what God has for Haiti in the future. All right. Well, you're well, doing the Lord's work, work, Drew. Thank you. You guys, Absolutely. You guys have a good night.